So first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I wanted to thank Dr. Chen, Dr. Kirby, and Dr. Dimmick who brought me down to UAB. Uh, in light of the holiday weekend, uh, it's a great honor to speak today. Uh, it doesn't seem like too long ago I was worrying about getting into medical school, worrying if I'd be a surgical resident, worrying about all this stuff in the future, whether or not I would achieve my goals, be able to do what I love to do. And I got a great bit of advice from my father, which is no matter what you do, pick something that you love to do. Because in the end, every morning when you wake up, you'll, you'll never have to work again. You love going into work. And I think I'm incredibly fortunate that I get to work at a great center, work with great people, and do every day what I love. So again, I have a ton of material to get through today. Uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, again, first of all, I have no financial disclosures or anything to disclose. And to really understand how burn care has advanced over the years, you kind of have to start off with where we started from to see really how far we've come along. Now, prior to the 1800s, burn care was pretty rudimentary. Basically, it involved slapping on a bunch of salves or poultices or random treat folk treatments over onto burns, and patients didn't do very well. There was minimal understanding as to the mechanisms of the pathophysiology and the classification of burns, and naturally, these patients uh, had pretty poor outcomes. Uh, in about the 1800s, where we started to see an improvement in the knowledge base, the mechanisms of burn were very similar to what we had today. There were cooking injuries, industrial accidents, house fires, and even though there were no accelerants such as gasoline or kerosene or YouTube, there was quite a bit of uh, gunpowder accidents in the day. Now, in the 1800s, this is where we started to have an inkling into understanding the, the different aspects of burn care, the pathophysiology. People started to describe and share the results, and the knowledge base started to spread. They started classifying burns as much as six degrees of burns, uh, extending all the way down into bone. And Post-mortem exams actually started to vastly improve our, our knowledge as to why people died from burns. Uh, Curling and Dupuytren wrote about their associated pathophysiology they saw with chronic burn injuries, and this is where we started to have a real understanding of as to why things happen. Now, still, this doesn't mean things were great. Back in the 1800s, they wrote of using diuretics and bloodletting and leaching <coughs> to assist in people in the acute burn phase. So. Though there was some improvement in the knowledge, there was still a long way to go. Now, the beginnings of modern bird care happened in the late 19th century, where they started understanding the pathophysiology of shock and the initial phases of uh, burn resuscitation. They described keeping patients warm and giving stimulants to sort of help keep these patients hemodynamically stable, but at this point, burn resuscitation still hadn't uh, existed. Now, in the late 1900s, Inspector General Smart, who uh, was involved in a large uh, mass casualty where 80 uh, sailors were injured by a boiler explosion, and he started categorizing how serious a burn injury is and associated it with its effect on mortality and morbidity. And what he found that just 500 centimeters squared, which would be about from my fingertips over to about my wrist, was associated with a threat to life. Of the 80 soldiers that were involved in this boiler explosion, most of them died. And back, back in the day, just 350 centimeters squared, which would be something about half of my leg, would be uniformly fatal from a steam burn. And just 1,600 centimeters squared, which is roughly about the size of my arm, so less than a 10% burn, would be uniformly fatal with a gunpowder or a deeper third-degree <coughs> burn. So... Even as science advanced, burn injuries were usually fatal, and there wasn't very uh, good medical care up until this point. Now, this started this change as they started discovering different ways to treat the topical agents of burn. James Bigelow started using the first animal model where they actually did scientific method to experiment with different topical antiseptics to try to prevent infection. And one of the things that he came up with was Dakin solution, a, a common uh, solution that we still use now. And this is where they started using antibacterials as opposed to poultices and, and gunpowder and, and other sort of re remedies, though oftentimes those who work in the trauma base still see people coming in in mustard and mayonnaise and other sorts of home remedies. Now, they also started looking at other aspects of the pathophysiology. This is the first time they started recognizing that you have to not just treat the, the topical injury but also pain. 
They started using morphine and brandy and started giving nutrition and started understanding that this was crucial to the healing as well. However, it was still in its infancy. Now, skin grafting has been around for centuries. I was surprised that uh, the first skin graft uh, occurred over 600 B.C. by an Indian doctor named Shishreta. However, the widespread application of skin grafting didn't occur until late in the 1900s. Giuseppe Baronio uh, first described his first autologous skin graft. He took a piece of skin off of one side of the back of a ram and auto-transplanted it to the other side of the ram, and he found that the skin, even though he excised it off, had excellent take. Uh, Jacques-Louis Reverdin uh, was able to close the first large-scale wound in an actual burn patient using autologous skin grafts and wrote about it and started to popularize uh, skin grafting in the treatment of burns. Uh, anyone here, a minimally invasive surgeon, uh, know what the, recognize what the Rever- Reverdin's name is associated with? Any of our residents? He created a needle used to close laparoscopic ports that's still used today. They called it the Reverdin needle. I don't know what they call it now. Hmm. Bit of random trivia. Also, other pioneers in the 20th century further sort of uh, fine-tuned skin grafting and, and, and made it to what it is today. So what all these little basic increments of understanding did was they rapidly started to improve mortality. If you look at the 1950s, across all comers, uh, uh, roughly 20% burn was was the LD50. This is about the size of a burn that half of the people would die. As we go into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and today, you see that there's a gradual uptrend of burns. Whereas today, the LD50 for all comers coming into the burn center is roughly about a 65% burn is now fatal in about half of all comers. In pediatric patients, that number is up to the 90% total body surface area burn. So there's been a dramatic increase from something the size of my hand and wrist being fatal to now almost 90% of a, a, a young, healthy patient's body being survivable. So why is this? I think a lot of it has to do with moving away from this. For those of you who have kids, you know who Gru and the Minions are. And this is sort of the old model where there was one leader and everyone else was the Minion who followed his orders. We've kind of moved away from this, and what we recognize is that to give adequate medical care, we need a multidisciplinary approach. We need a team-based approach where everyone is working together in conjunction as opposed to this. And we literally have an army here at UAB of of folks taking care of our burn patients. So now what I would say our our new model of care is more like a clock. Even though you have sort of bigger pieces and smaller pieces, if any of those little pieces involved in the care are absent, the whole clock breaks down. The wristwatch (laughs) breaks down. The other thing that has changed is now burn centers have become highly specialized areas. Before Just any sort of doc who hung up his shingle would take care of these people. Now we have what we call verified burn centers, centers of excellence which are trained to go take care of these burn wounds, and this is what they do day in, day out. It's kind of like the cardiac model where they found that high-volume heart centers have much better outcomes than the guy that does it now and then. So which would you rather use to go and chop down a tree? Would you rather use the jack-of-all-trades, or would you rather use the specialized tool? So this has dramatically improved our survival. The other thing that we've done is we've protocolized our treatment using the best data that we have and applying that science to go give burn patients the best possible care. This is a a flow chart of our protocols for treating someone when they come in from the ED all the way down to the OR. And this models the same sort of treatment that we have for the surviving sepsis guidelines, ATLS, ACLS. Now, Burn care has improved monumentally. We've had improvements in the pathophysiology, improvements in our protocols, improvements in our our wound care, and improvements in our surgical management. So knowing where we've come from, where can we go now for even better improvement? Because I don't think we're there yet. So there are great opportunities for improvement in all aspects of care. So for the residents, does anyone know the name of this chart? Anyone? Garner, where are you? Evan Garner. What? All right, 
This is called the London Browder chart. What do we use this for, Evan? <laughs> Okay, now this chart is used at ERs all across the state. And when they send us our burn, like for instance this past weekend, the 75% burn that came in had 6% total body surface area burn. And this is a problem. I once had a, a patient that got airlifted from across the state with a 96% burn. I waited in the emergency department waiting for this guy from a gasoline explosion to come in and I was going to pronounce some comfort care and just try to make him comfortable at knees his suffering, when it turns out he was burned solely on his ear. This gentleman liked to mow his lawn in the buff and was sunburned over most of his body and was filling up his lawnmower with gasoline and it kind of flashed up but only burned a small portion of his, his ear. It was not a 96% life-threatening burn. And part of the problem is there are no great ways that we have right now to go sort of show people how to go estimate burn size out in the community and base our treatment for our resuscitation or our stabilization of these patients. We have charts and we have sort of rules to help them identify it. The problem is that there are not that many burn centers across the country, so most people have never received formal training in burn. Many of them have never seen a large burn. So luckily with technology now, everyone has a smartphone, <coughs> and there are a lot of developers who are coming up with great new ideas for how to go calculate out these burns. Uh, one manufacturer, one app has come up with an app where you can take a picture of these burns, you can go look at them, and based on this, you can accurately calculate out the size of the burn. This was a study where they had a bunch of untrained medical students who, with this app, were able to uh, very closely calculate out the total body surface area of a burn, on, and these are individuals who had never seen a burn before, never calculated one out before. Now, why is the calculation of the size of the burn so important? And the reason has to do with how we treat them. Initially, when a patient comes on, and for the residents, you may want to remember this formula, it's been on every in-service examination for the last 20 years. This is called the Parkland formula. And with the Parkland formula, we, we estimate the size of the burn, and we calculate how much fluid they get in the initial period of the burn and over the next 24 hours. This has since been modified to the modified Parkland formula. The American Burn Association has reduced the quantity of, of fluid that we give to patients because we found that these patients were getting too much fluid over in the field. Now, why does that matter? Why does over-resuscitation matter? Oftentimes, I'll ask someone in the emergency department, how are they doing? How's their urine output? And I hear, oh, it's great. It's 500 cc's, 600 cc's an hour. That's not great. Even though their kidneys are being perfused, the problem is you're going to live with that fluid later because all that fluid has to go somewhere. This is a phenomenon called fluid creep. When you give too much of a good thing, you still have to pay for it later. That, all that fluid has to go somewhere. And the problem is when that fluid goes to places that you don't want to go, it can result in serious sequela that is a threat to life. So this is a picture for the, anyone who can recognize this. What is this? What is this the beginning of? ARDS, again, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Basically, the lungs are like a sponge. It can only hold so much stuff. It could either be air, which you can breathe, or it can be fluid that you resuscitate. If you give too much of a good thing, there's no space left for those lungs to fill up with air, and these people cannot oxygenate their tissue, and they will die. So with burns, ARDS is a very bad thing. The mortality results... Uh, are estimated up to up to 80% if you develop ARDS. However, over the last couple decades, we've developed a lot of sort of rescue methods, advances in our vent technology, advances in dialysis, advances with uh, extracorporeal uh, support and oxygenation, and all of these have helped, but still the best treatment is to prevention, to not do this in the first place. So accurate estimation may be one of the uh, single best things that we do to go prevent this from happening. Now again, compartment syndrome is another real effect. For those of you who have been in the trauma bay and seen people come in, about six, seven, eight injuries after burn, their own mothers look at them and they don't recognize them because they've blown up like the Michelin man. That's how edematous they have become. And when this extends over to areas which cannot expand, to areas which are non-expandable, due to the kind of like over chicken, overcooked chicken, the tightness of the skin as it, it 
cooks fully, that's a threat to life. It's a, a threat to limb loss and a threat to life when the chest can't expand and ventilate. We have to do these debilitating surgeries uh, to go treat this, which result in scars and, and disfigurement. This is an example of a Bogota bag in someone who had their belly opened up to release the pressure over in the belly. In cases like this, it's almost 100% fatal. It's been described as 99% fatal in burns. So what can we do to improve all this? So again, abdominal compartment syndrome associated with organ dysfunction and increased pressures in the belly. So what, what can we do to prevent this? So one group over in, in uh, Minnesota came up with an idea, and that was, you know, every time we call the residents, they're really busy, they have to go down to the ER, they have to see traumas, they can't always get up to us. What if we could give a protocol for the nurses who are bedside, who are sitting there taking care of the patients, who can look at the same numbers? Could we come up with an algorithm for them to titrate the fluids? Because rather than the resident coming by maybe two or three times a day, especially when they're busy, what if the person who's bedside could go titrate the fluid on their own several times a day and get that fluid down to prevent that over-resuscitation or under-resuscitation. So they created an algorithm for nurses to go do this, and they found they were highly successful. In fact, they were able to give adequate resuscitation and do this successfully. They also had escape clauses. They had uh, ways for them to call for help if things weren't going well, where they could call for the resident or the attending to come and help them. This was taken a step further by uh, Salinas over in the Army, and what they said is, well, you know, if these nurses can do a great job using this algorithm every three, four hours, could we even, cl even uh, closer or tighter control their fluid resuscitation independently using a computer? Some of you are familiar with the new ventilators, which actually look at a patient's breath to breath and calculate based on how they're doing second to second uh, auto-weaning mode. And they use the same sort of fuzzy logic or algorithm in computers to go and further wean the fluid. So this is the system that they had. They took a computer which was hooked up to the electronic medical record that was monitoring the patient's vitals, blood pressure, heart rate, and urine output every 15 minutes and adjusting the fluid continuously throughout the resuscitation. What they found is this resuscitation did a much better job than even a, a trained physician could. So this is probably something that's coming and on the way. Right now, our system, we have a, a similar sort of resuscitation protocol which we've implemented and have been very successful in our resuscitations, but we may take this a step further in the future where this may be run even independently from practitioners. And again, these patients did very, very well with lower hospital days, ICU days, and ventilator days. So another stage of improvement that we've had are, are advancements in wound care. Gone are the days of putting you know, poultices and, and tree leaves on wounds. Uh, we've discovered all sorts of textiles, antibiotics, and topicals which have vastly improved our, our outcomes. We've also come up with new <coughs> synthetic biologics which result in less sequela in terms of scarring and functional loss from these burn injuries. So, what makes a good dressing? A good dressing is something that's going to help healing, is going to work well, is going to be easy and acceptable to practitioners. And we have to look at the cost as well, too, especially nowadays with CMS. Uh, the hospital is in a tight bind with Medicare, Medicaid, and state finances. We have to be responsible sort of caretakers of costs in terms of our treatment. So how do we pick something in terms of uh, the best possible treatment to use? Again, we have a whole list of agents that, are, that, that we can use. We have multiple types of antibacterials. Uh, the current standard of care is silver sulfadiazine, or silvadine, as many of you call it. It's a great antibiotic agent. It's relatively cheap. But honestly, it, it's a 30, 40-year-old technology which, which really doesn't do that great of a job. It, it's very painful. I, I heard a Duke professor speak about his experience of suffering a 60% burn where every day he, while he was laying awake would just count down the seconds. He would make a game, mental game thinking how much time he had left till his next burn care. And he described it as imagine if your whole body was ripped clean of skin and then once a day the nurses came and poured alcohol all over you. And that was a daily occurrence. It's incredibly painful. 
So it's not just painful to the patient, to the nurses taking care of them and all the people who are in the unit. For those of you who have trained before the 90s, they used to describe how they'd come into the unit and they'd hear the screams coming down the hallway as people would get their dressings changed every day. It's a very traumatic event. So one of the new developments that they've come are textile-based dressings, which are long-term dressings. These are dressings that are impregnated with the same silver ion present in silver silvadiazine, but these textile-based agents don't need to be changed daily. They can actually last for as long as two weeks. And what these do is they free these patients from the daily torture or the daily treatment of dressing changes. Instead of having their, their wounds changed every day, you can clean them up once successfully and then leave these on for a week or so. Without the narcotics, without the sedation, without the painful trauma, these patients do better. They're more awake. They have time to do their therapy. They have time to eat because they're not knocked out for six hours after each dressing change. So we've found that these thing, dressings have been a godsend. This is just a list of some of them. Every day there are more and more popping up, and I just had some slides showing you what they look like. They come in multiple sizes and shapes and forms. They come in uh, gels. They come in sheets. They come in gloves. They come in rolls. They even come in shirts, too. This is another common one that we use over here. Some of you are familiar with Mepilex AG. It's a bilayer non-stick dressing, and this is much less painful to go remove because it has a silicon layer which is non-adhesive. This is another product called Millican which I was involved in a clinical trial with. Again, good for seven days, had excellent outcomes. And what, the other thing we found is these dressings, because they only have to be changed once a week, they're actually one third of the cost is our traditional standard of care in terms of nursing time, dressing time, medications such as pain medications, and the overall cost of materials are 70% less. So these, I think, are, are are here to stay, and these are the future of, of sort of burn wound care. Now, we've also come up with some biologic dressings, and what these are, are these are synthetic and animal-based products which are used as temporary dressings to help physiologically close burn wounds, and as an added bonus, what we found is they greatly decrease scarring and improve functionality of these burn injuries. We also have come up with epithelial cultured grafts as well as stem cell treatment for, for uh, burns as well. <coughs> so biologically uh, engineered dressings like Integral or Primatrix, these are again our, our engineered dressings which mimic the skeleton sort of scaffolding structure of the dermis and replace it. These can help close wounds early on in an injury and allow these patients to sort of get better quicker. This is just a picture of Integra in a burn wound where we place this on, place it in a wound vac for approximately a week or so, and then we can graft afterwards with much less scarring and better functionality, especially somewhere close to, say, a tendon like the Achilles or a joint. Now, the advantages of, of these dressings, again, are they're fantastic in terms of their outcome. They close these wounds, they reduce pain, and they do a very nice job of improving our skin graft takes. However, they're not without their disadvantages as well. One of the big disadvantages they have is their cost. Uh, we just did a, a young child uh, just last week uh, who had a very tragic accident. More than half of his body was covered in full thickness burns. He was going to have horrible scarring, and we did this treatment to him. But it was over $100,000 of product alone to get him covered. Now, I think it's well worth it in this case. He was only a 16-year-old boy. And what we found is the outcome in terms of functionality, he should have an excellent functional return where he'll be able to play sports, do things, and he'll look better. He won't look like a horrible, horrifically scarred burn injury. So you, there is a significant value to these products as well. They're also difficult to use just because they, there is a steeper learning curve learning how to go handle these, when to use them, how to use them. And again, with an expensive product, that's... That is a big downside. Also, because these are, <clears throat> are a little bit more difficult to use for the novice, infection is a real uh, risk as well. He was also a member of the uh, 101st Airborne Division who was hit by an, who hit an IA, IED over in the war, and he suffered significant burns. After his injury, he underwent over 34 surgeries, including skin grafting and scar revision, and this is his outcome. Now, after this accident, 
he chose to do quite a bit. He's a motivational speaker. He was on a soap opera. I think it was All My Children or something like that. And he also chose to compete in a very public forum of Dancing with the Stars. I think that's outstanding. This young lady was uh, in a book, a photography book, which showed burn victims showing their scars. And I think she's a beautiful young woman. And if you look at her, she wears those scars proudly. She owns them. She doesn't try to hide them. And I think that's wonderful. But I don't think this is good enough. I think we can do much, much better. So what can we do to improve our cosmetic outcomes? Not just our functional outcomes. What can we do to improve our, not just our survival, but also our cosmesis and our function? So there are a number of technologies that we've come up with. One of the sequela are these little sort of divots or these sort of mesh patterns present in the way that we cut skin or mesh skin to cover things. So one of the advancements that we've come up with as opposed to just cutting the skin with a scalpel blade or meshing them is there are some new meshers available which minimally cut the skin. And what these do is these little cuts in the skin when we do a skin graft, they allow serum, blood, exudate to go uh, escape from underneath the skin graft or skin takes, but, and they also allow expansion. But when you cut too much, it creates these patterns which are very cosmetically visible. So one of the products that have come out with is a minimal, e, a minimal perforation measure, which still allows the seroma and blood to drain, but has much better <coughs> outcome. This is just a hand graft that was uh, performed using this minimally invasive measure. This is it being placed on. This is it post-op. And long-term, the outcomes have been cosmetically much, much better than what we've seen before in the past. Another uh, great advancement that came out several years ago is the use of cultured epithelial autographs. When we have large burn wounds where we just don't have enough sites to take skin from and graft, another thing that we can do is we can biopsy a small piece of skin, send it off to a lab in Texas where they will grow confluent sheets of skin cells on a medium and then three weeks later, they ship to us several little packages of, of little rectangular pieces of skin about so large. And this has enabled us to go and burn, graft very large burns and get them successfully through surgery. However, it's not with its disadvantages. Again, because these are just uh, epithelial cells that are grown in suspension, there's no sort of latticework or scaffold or dermis which gives the skin its normal elastic and, and functional properties. These are kind of, the best thing I can describe it, they look like wet pieces of tissue paper. They're extremely fragile, and even after you place them on the wound, because they don't have any fibroblasts or other tissue uh, associated with normal skin, they're very fragile, and they tend to sort of look not very nice. Uh, these people have a lot of problems with contractures and, and uh, sort of fixed joints and scarring. They do survive. However, this isn't sort of a, a great, great uh, solution. So what else can we do? So this is a piece, pizza cutter. One guy came up with this great idea where if he took a bunch of these pizza cutters and he welded these pizza cutters together. And what he did was he took a small piece of skin and using those pizza cutters welded together, he sliced it one direction and turned the cutter to 90 degrees and sliced it another direction. And then what he did was he used all of these little pieces of skin that were well, not microscopic, but very, very small, and he arranged these in a grid-like pattern over on a burn wound to see if this could re-epithelialize a wound. This was called the Meeks technique, and what they did is they placed these little pieces of skin perfectly spaced <coughs> apart on the back of a uniform burn created on a Yorkshire pig, and then sprayed them with furniture polish, polyurethane, to make them sort of stick and stay on. And what they found was that each little piece of skin grew out and, and this little technique was able to go and re-epithelialize a, a standardized burn wound. And it did it successfully at only two weeks. So how does this work? Now, if you have a wound over here, let's say 100 millimeters, and every day you have healing from the edges Again, this is a bad wound where you have no skin underneath, so the only way it can heal is from the sides. 
And again, this is growing at one millimeter per day. How long is this 100 millimeter wound going to take to heal? Anyone? Trick question. It's going to take 50 days because you have healing from this side and you have healing from this side. Now just say you had one little island of sparing in the center of the skin where you had skin healing from this direction and this direction, but also from the edges. Now you've reduced that healing on that wound from 50 days to 25 days. Now, however, if you do this Meeks technique where you have multiple little foci of skin scattered throughout, this is going to heal very rapidly because now you have multiple areas of skin healing in. And that's why these areas were able to heal very quickly. Once they are confluent, once they have contact inhibition, then they start growing up like normal skin. And the outcomes for these were significantly better than with the cultured epithelial grafts in terms of function. So here's those little skin things growing. They become confluent and they heal the wound. <coughs> so is there a better way than we, than we can do it than actually gluing on little pieces of, of skin? Because as far as I know, polyurethane is not FDA approved in the use of humans. The other thing too is it took a poor medical student researcher hours and hours and hours applying these things in a grid-like pattern. That's something that we don't have. We, we can't afford the luxury of doing in the OR on a patient who's physiologically unstable. We have to be quick to get them off the table. So some people looked at some other possible techniques. And one of the things they looked at was stem cells and, and burn patients. And one idea was spraying on some embryonic stem cells over on a standardized burn on the back of, of mice. What they found is is yes, this grew out skin, it also grew out teeth and hair and nails, and so it wasn't a, a, a great option. What we needed to do was inoculate these wounds with, say, skin cells to see if we could grow them out. So another group over in Korea tried to go and culture some skin cells from a burn patient and spray these onto these <laughs> burn wounds to see if this could work. And this was one of the first reported uh, episodes of spraying on skin cells directly onto burn wounds. And what they found was when they took these small biopsies of skin cells, they were able to do large burn wounds very quickly with very good take at approximately a month. So this is the, kind of the beginnings of, of the newfangled you know, uh, science fiction type treatment. Uh, if you guys remember Star Trek from the old days, the doctor would always hold this little thing over them and all of a sudden the patient would be better. It's almost like magic. What if we could do a similar sort of thing? What if we could take a very small area of skin and sort of spray it onto a much larger wound without having to take similar equivalent size injuries? Because the traditional method of treating a, a burn, you create a new injury to treat another injury. Now that new injury, because we shave it off at one one hundredth of an inch, that's going to heal very quickly. It'll heal in about seven days to two weeks. However, it's still creating a new injury on these patients. What if instead of taking an equivalent size uh, piece of skin, what if we could take a very small size piece of skin and have the same sort of treatment? So there, there's a new uh, product that's about to be on the market. We were involved in a, a research study where we looked at this sort of spray on skin. Now this is the patient's own skin. We harvest a little small postage size piece of skin and we spray it onto these larger burn areas to see if this would actually work and if this was equivalent to the standard of care of autografting. This has already gone uh, FDA phase two and phase three trials. The data has been locked uh, <coughs> back last summer and is in review. We should be hearing something in the next 10 months. It should be approved. It's already approved over in Europe and the, and the uh, outcomes we have had have been excellent. So just some pictures. This is a picture of a infant's hand that was burned with a scald burn where they treated this child with this spray on skin and the outcomes at 12 week were excellent much greater than much better than what we traditionally see with uh, typical skin grafting one year afterwards if you look at the difference in terms of cosmetic and a texture this is far better than the sort of meshed ridge patterns that we typically see with our standard of care of skin grafting and, and why is that this is a, a large burn um, in a pediatric patient that underwent a combination of spray-on skin and wide mesh grafting. They basically mesh the skin by making little cuts in it to expand <coughs> it 
to the point where it looked like spider webs being applied to a wound, and then they oversprayed. They sprayed the spray-on skin over the top of this skin graft. And what they found is after doing this, just three weeks after application, all the wounds had healed. This is incredibly unusual for a wide mesh skin graft. Usually our take rates for something like this are very poor, and the co cosmetic outcomes are not very good. This patient left the hospital, I think, six weeks after uh, injury, and this patient had a very, very large burn. It was close to an 80% burn. That was unheard of at the time, to have a patient do that well and leave the hospital so quickly. The outcomes long-term cosmetically were far better than what we've seen. And this is how it works. This is the example of the kit. This comes in a, a, a small desktop kit. You harvest a small piece of skin off of the patient like you would a normal skin graft. The expansion ratio that the company advises right now is 80 times. So one centimeter of skin will expand to 80 centimeters. Uh, what we found in the trials are, are when we initially did this, we were successfully able to expand up to 250 times. And what the company doesn't say is half of the time when we'd spray this stuff on, half of the solution would just drip down into the table. So we were finding that we, the expansion rates could probably even be higher than what the company recommends. It takes about 30 minutes to process the skin. <coughs> you harvest the skin. You place it in a proteolytic bath to break up all the little skin, to skin cell bonds until it's just a solution of skin cells. You scrape off the skin afterwards and put it through a filter, draw it up into a syringe, and then you spray it directly onto the wound. This whole process takes about 30 minutes, so it's done in the operating room while your team is also uh, excising the burns. And the reason why that cosmetic outcome seems to be so much better than what we've traditionally seen is instead of just spraying on isolated epithelial cells, the mash that we're spraying on are multiple different types of cells, fibroblasts, melanocytes, epithelial cells, and something about the cell-cell <coughs> interaction. We already know from healing that healing is based on the communication between multiple different types of cells telling each other how to go and heal and what to heal. And we think that the combination of these multiple cell types sprayed onto the wound allows for better healing with less scarring. Again, th this is a close-up of the kit. <coughs> and we can skip through this stuff. I, I like this case. This is a patient that I grafted with the technique. We randomized the burn into two separate areas, and we just picked one to do the skin graft on and one to do the spray on skin on. This is the size of the donor site in the traditional site. Uh, site. This is the skin graft in the spray on skin site. So compare the two in terms of size. We applied the thing, and roughly a month out, this is how the two of them looked. Now, four months out, it looked significantly better than I than the skin graft site, which still had a very good outcome. But look at the spray on site a year out. You have to really look to see where he was burned and excised. The cosmetic outcome over here was significantly better. In fact, this gentleman came back to my clinic and told me he was at the barber's chair talking about how he was burned, and the gentleman next to him grabbed him by the arm and started looking at his arm and saying, wow, that." That looks really good. Who did that? And he said, oh, the Chinese guy over at uh, Chapel Hill. <laughs> and so he was pointing to the, uh, the normal traditional autographed site over on his bicep area and said, that's good work. And he was like, yeah, and the forearm looks even better. And so the two of them proceeded to argue where the plastic, or the gentleman in the chair next to him said, no, you weren't burned there. You weren't operated there. And he said, yes, I was. It was my arm. I know I, I had a surgery there. And he goes, no, you weren't. I'm a, I'm a former burn surgeon. I've taken care of burns for 20 years. You were not skin grafted there. And he said, yes, I was. They did that spray on skin stuff. Well, he wasn't able to convince the guy, but... I just love that story because the guy in the barber chair next to him just happened to be a burn surgeon and he just couldn't believe that the outcome there was that good. So we actually had several cases like that and I'm looking forward to the approval of this product in the next year or so. Again, this is how the rest of his arm looked at one year. It was a significant difference in terms of sort of texture and cosmesis. So we're really looking forward to this product. In fact, uh, we were planning on using this next week on a large burn that we had just admitted. However, 
uh, due to financial considerations, the family asked the patient to be transferred over to Shriners just because of the free care provided over at Shriners. But we were all set. We, um, we uh, applied for compassionate use exemption from uh, the IRB here at UAB, and we were all set to proceed next week. Uh, ho well, hopefully we'll get a chance to use it again on another patient soon because I think it has great promise. And again, this is the donor site of the traditional site at one year, healed back very nicely. If you can find it, that's the, the resell site, donor site, which is very small. It's about the size of a postage stamp. So I think I'm running out of time over here. So again, for burn education, one of the problems, again, about taking care of burn patients, like we mentioned out in the community, is that there aren't that many centers which do burn care. There's sort of few and far between and very scattered. It is a very specialized uh, profession which not a lot of people go into every year. This is a map showing burn centers across the United States and their distance uh, via air and ground. This is a close-up of it. And if you look at the number of, of <coughs> U.S. burn centers or verified burn centers throughout the country, the vast majority of medical professionals, the vast majority of physicians are not going to be trained at a center with a burn center. So they're not going to have the training and understanding to recognize, treat, and, and appropriately triage these patients. So we can't really fault our, our rural partners when they send us a burn and they say, you know, it's a 60% or 70% and turns out to be a 4% or 5%. They don't know. They've never been exposed to it. So how do we, account, how do we fix this disparity? Now, obviously, I was going to talk to Dr. Chen and Dr. Teslin. We need to, our residents to spend quite a bit more time on burn care. In fact, I'm, I'm proposing that they spend an, a year or two extra. <laughs> well, there are a lot of laughs. I was kind of serious. but <laughs> Anyways, when we look at the burn referrals and we look and see how, again, our rural partners do in terms of triaging, identifying these patients and figuring out who needs to come to a burn center, they do a... And not a very good job. It's difficult. They haven't had the proper training, like we said, and they just don't know. So that can be a problem, especially when we talk about that guy that I told you was mowing his lawn in the buff and was sunburned. And they estimated a 97% burn injury, and, and that was sunburn because only a, a, about 1% was actually true surgical burn. So that poor gentleman got stuck with a $40,000 helicopter bill for essentially something that could be treated with some calamine lotion and, and noxema, some cold cream. So telemedicine is an exciting new uh, development where all of you now have smartphones. You text images to each other. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. It's Skypey or Skype. People, people use that all the time to go and transfer video and data. However, there are some problems with using this technology because, again, it has to be HIPAA compliant, it has to be secured, it has to be uh, something that can't be saved and shared later. There are multiple rules to using uh, technology. And for telemedicine, what they found is, can this be used for burn care? So what they found is, especially in rural areas, where we set up specific HIPAA compliant, technology compliant telemedicine thing, it's a great tool in terms of helping guide treatment. If you can go and save someone that $40,000 helicopter ride, if you can accurately estimate their burn size and get them resuscitating that patient better earlier, more accurately, <coughs> you can save that patient a significant amount of time, money, and, and it vastly improve their improve, uh, survival. They also looked at whether or not air travel can drastically be reduced by using uh, telemedicine and found that uh, telemedicine can dramatically improve sort of uh, guiding these people to who needs air travel versus who can get away with ground travel. Uh, when we were over at UNC, UNC uh, had several hospitals throughout the state scattered throughout. And what we did is we set up a command hub with a robot or a high definition uh, web camera with robots throughout uh, affiliated emergency departments throughout the state. And what we found was it wasn't just the physician who could actually help guide uh, treatment, but we could actually use this for other applications other than just the acute phase. Because a lot of our patients ha don't have two nickels to rub together. They're extremely, extremely stressed financially. And having an injury like this is extremely stressful. 
but what if our physical therapist could just go hop on the, the robot and talk to the physical ther therapist 250 miles away and tell them, oh, all you need to do is do this stretching. You don't need a new garment yet. We just save that patient a six-hour car trip or bus ticket, which they normally just don't have the finances to go do. So what this is is, in the words of uh, <clears throat> my colleagues, uh, Dr. Anderson, and the folks over in the Special Forces Unit, this is a force multiplier. At Chapel Hill, we did a lot of work with the 18 Deltas, the Special Forces. And what the Green Berets and the Special Forces do is they take a highly skilled, sort of trained group of people, take them out into the field, and train other people, multiplying their impact or their force or their expertise. In a lot of ways, we can do the same thing. This is a drone command center. You have highly specialized, highly skilled pilots, but instead of having just have multiple groups of pilots who you set all over the world, they can stay in one place in, in DC and they can just be uplinked through uh, the web to go to any part of the world where they can engage bad guys using, again, technology. In the same way, we can take the technology, the expertise, and the skill of not just our physicians, but our therapists, our nurses, our wound care people, and we could bring UAB out into the community to one of these smaller rural hospitals that don't have the resources. So I see this as probably one of the biggest advances in, in, in medicine and burn care, and it's on the way. Uh, we have a center here at UAB which is looking to aggressively expand its telemedicine uh, use over in the state, and I know that the trauma department, ACS, and burn are all looking for ways that we can can do this. Again, this is on the short list of things that we have to do. Again, we have uh, 150 other things that we have to do, but this is one of our, our top priorities, and we're looking forward to this. So in the interest of time, I want to thank everyone for allowing to be here and to lecture. Again, burn care is really exciting and an expanding field. The technology that we're using, again, we have to proceed forward with caution and, and and really be thoughtful of how we use it. A lot of these products and technologies are expensive. And, and also, we have to ask, just because we can do it, do we need to do it? Now, I also wanted to thank everyone again, Dr. Chen and Dr. Kirby, who brought me over here to UAB. Uh, my colleague and friend, Steve Thomas, is in the audience. He uh, is a former burn director over here, and he uh, graciously agreed to come here today. I appreciate his support. And I wanted to thank all the residents and all the APPs, all the uh, nurses, the therapists who work with me every day. Because again, going back to what I originally said, you have to love what you do. You have to wake up every morning and love what you do. One of the reasons why I love working here, love working with the people I do, is because of the shared enthusiasm and love of what we do. I see several of my colleagues uh, here in the audience who, who came and I appreciate their support. but. This is a fantastic institution. I'm happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to growing and, and, and doing all these things in the future. So thank you very much.